So thanks for coming down. New for 23. It doesn't quite have the same ring as uh, last year's. New for 22 had a nice ring to it. But, <laughs> but uh, we're always looking for new stuff for our customers. Uh, there are some pretty cool plants. I've probably got 10 or 12 on here that I'm not sure where I'm going to fit them, but I will get them when they come in. Probably have to replace something I already have in the same spot. So, so uh, thanks for coming. I'm Trevor, our general manager here. Do most of our classes. You're probably getting used to seeing me here. Who's uh, who's new to classes at Sunnyside? We got anybody new? Nice, welcome. Yeah, we always have a a nice crowd. New for new for this year's uh, exciting one to kind of get started on. Um, as I mentioned to most everybody, if you came in late, that blue link right there is our new plant site on our website. It's live as of yesterday, so there's pictures, all the information's on there. Uh, the handout would be like 18 pages long. It's a lot of plants. Um, so I did not print them for everybody. We try to save a couple trees, but you can certainly look on your cell phone during class where most all of them will have the, in a quick slideshow because there's about 135 plants on here we're going to do in 60 minutes. So how's that? We'll go fast. Um, just real quick, you know, kind of for us, um, you know, why, why are we interested in you? This is probably one of the more fun parts of my job. I love my job, but, uh, but this is one of the things I enjoy. Last summer, doing a lot of traveling, doing a lot of touring, talking to our growers, going to plant geek shows all over the place, and kind of looking for what's new, you know, what's the latest, greatest kind of thing out there. Um, there's always new flavors of everything, and that doesn't mean we don't get all of them. No, some of them are like, that looks just like the one we already have, and we're fine with it. Um, but a lot of this stuff at growers, you know, sometimes they're planned. I'm sure you guys know in the garden business, there's people that play with pollen and genetics and this and that and they're trying to make a specific thing but a lot of these things sometimes happen by accident you know if I'm a grower and I've got 10,000 of something out in the block and one spring I walk out and I'm like well, wait a minute that's got yellow leaves coming out on it what's that if I can pull it aside get a stable cutting of it and be able to propagate it then maybe that's how I get a new plant too I know a lot of growers that's kind of trial by accident a little bit but a lot of it again is is uh, is intentional you know, for us, like I said, I don't want to bring in everything new every year. It's not worth it. There's some things that aren't good for our specific climate. You know, there's not a just a Pacific Northwest new plant introductions that go to the whole country. There's some things that simply won't thrive up here as well as they do in the south or other areas of the country. But, you know, why should we bring it in? Is it something, is it better than a variety we already carry for our customers? Is it some improved trait that, that we desire? Um, you know, a lot of times you're looking online right now, everybody probably gets emails from Proven Winners and Color Choice Shreds and all these different places online. They'll tell you, you know, go get it brand new this year. A lot of that stuff's not even ready for another year. It just kills me with Proven Winners in particular. They'll advertise this new hydrangea and it's like, yeah, available in garden centers in 2023. Well, usually we might see it in the fall, but it's probably more like a 2024 kind of thing. So. So be patient, a lot of this stuff takes just a little bit of time to, to come out. Um, a lot of times for us, fall, you know, I'm able to get a little demonstration. Some of these things I got a little bit in the fall. Now this spring, we have a little bit more inventory to probably show it off to our customers. So a lot of this we have tried a little bit in the fall just to see, sometimes I take them home and plant them in my yard to see how they do and then decide that we can, we can go that way too. Um, the big thing is characteristics, you know, why again, do I want to replace what we already have in inventory? And those to me are the basic reasons right there. Um, for retail, for gardeners like yourselves, it's probably flower power number one. You know, if I have something that's bigger, brighter, blooms longer, on and on and on, new color, <clears throat> that's always gonna, always gonna win. So flowering's a huge part of it. Uh, for me, a lot of times it's foliage. You know, is it better color? Is it larger? Is it a different shape? Is it variegated? something interesting, um, just more than the bloom. Um, the big one is growth habit. You know, a lot of people have smaller spaces, want to grow it in a pot, is it narrow, is it lower, is it more compact? You know, there's a lot of different traits with that as well. Um, a big one these days is disease and insect resistance. You know, a lot of times, if we take roses in particular, they're bred for resistance, never means immunity but you'll be better off not you know, getting one that's very prone to disease versus something that's a little more uh, resilient on its own. Um, you know, what does this mean to you? You know, we get it in and hopefully you get more satisfaction, a little less time, a little less maintenance in the garden. You've got a nice plant that just doesn't need quite as much work, okay? 
So we're gonna go through some big sections. Um, you know, certainly you could ask me, I'm here all day. So after the class, you could ask me about certain things. I'll kind of mention as we go some things that yes, we already have, or they're coming very soon. There'll be a couple things I'll say, okay, if you like that, make yourself a note and uh, we'll do it in the fall because there's a couple things I put on here that I'm pretty psyched about that really won't be out until late summer or kind of early fall time, okay? So I'm gonna sit here and look through slides fast and furious, except I can't see him over there because he's looking through the flower. <laughs> but uh, so new and roses, if you were at the rose class, you know, I kind of apologize, but here's the quick little review of kind of new. All these are in. Uh, we have the roses all ready to go every January. Um, so some of these, have, we have still all of them in stock, but all these are pretty worthwhile considering if you're new roses. Uh, Heavenly Scent, you can probably uh, guess that one smells very nice. Uh, it's a really good color, uh, nice hybrid tea, that's what the HT stands for. So disease resistant again, easy to grow, um, and a good cut flower. Uh, Morning Glow was a new Floribunda, and that's a different color to me. It's a little more goldy yellow versus yellow yellow. Again, decent fragrance on that and excellent disease resistance. The Floribunda roses tend to be more of a bouquet, something we could have out in the landscape as a shrub, enjoy the flowers, but not necessarily cut them to bring them inside. So that's kind of the, what, what I usually do for mine. I thought both these were outstanding. These are a little different. We tried these last year. You know, we demo roses a year ahead of time before they're released just to see how they do in, in our specific environment. Uh, raspberry cupcake um, you can see a lot of the breeders are going towards that English kind of quartered old-fashioned rose look and these are not from David Austin these are from a uh, star roses a little different grower raspberry cupcake smells like raspberry believe it or not it's a great description of the fragrance um, that's a nice tall hybrid tea very easy to grow and I thought top cream is one of the nicest whites I've seen in a while for some reason everybody is liking white for flower color again last couple years uh, that's an excellent new hybrid tea um, that we had really good luck with demoing last year. A couple new Austins, and this has probably been out on their website. You know, these aren't necessarily brand new for 2023, but Austin roses have been real hard to come by the last few years um, for us retailers. They're kind of getting caught up, so these are newer ones the last couple years that we finally have an inventory to offer our customers. So you've got ones like Vanilla, uh, Vanessa mm -hmm. Bell. Emily Bronte or Silas Mariner on the third page there. Um, you know, if I say Austin, I was kind of chuckled because the, the worst smelling Austin rose is probably better than the best smelling any other rose in the inventory. So if you're going for heavy old rose perfumey fragrance, you cannot be any of the David Austin roses. We've got a nice selection back there, but those are three uh, perhaps on the newer side. Uh, picture perfect. I think it's a good example of kind of a new type of rose. A lot of the breeders, you know, 20 years ago, I would have said, you can't grow that here, move to South America, it looks like an old florist rose. When we had those kind of florist shop roses that were one color, and you almost turned them upside down, and you got the, the petals underneath were a different color. So if you're looking at it, really cool kind of two-tone color effect. Um, that one's gonna have cream with kind of that, that corally color going. Um, but again, with breeding here over the decades, they've really got these to performing well in our local gardens now, not necessarily just in a, in a warmer, hotter climate like Southern California. Uh, Uptown Girl, I'm calling the Christy Brinkley Rose. If you're an 80s child like me, we'll just call it that, Billy Joel's song. Uh, that's a tall Grandiflora. So Grandiflora Rose is much taller. That'll probably reach a good six feet in the growing season. Big, long stems, another one we can cut but those are kind of our exhibition roses. If you're looking for big plants, large flowers, that's got decent fragrance as well. Um, I think the best new rose this year is Sultry Night. You know, if I was to pick one, it's an interesting color, kind of a plummy purple. Um, it's got great smell. It smells like grapefruit, believe it or not, kind of a citrusy grapefruit smell. But that is on its own root. It's a shrub rose and it is indestructible. So if I'm interested in growing a rose for color in the landscape, and some good smell and not spraying you're probably your best chance of all the ones we're talking about today is sultry night i think that's a we i leave those alone at the nursery no spraying and they were fabulous last year so we got a bunch this season and, and have those in stock um not for new new for us these are old roses but 
Um, I finally got talked into bringing back miniature roses, or they call them patio roses now. So if you're ever looking for a small rose bush that we can grow in a container, only reach a couple of feet tall, um, and bloom all summer, it's a great container choice, or for small gardens. Uh, we do have many minis or patio roses. You'll see those uh, back there in the patio rose section. We got a few colors of those this year. <coughs> and then Monrovia has brought out this seaside swirl. So has anyone done Ragosa roses? Um, you know what I mean? Like drive the lawnmower over them. The cities plant them in the parking strips. They don't have any maintenance. We would never spray Ragosa rose or we would damage them. So these are literally indestructible. If you give them a little water and some food on occasion, these will grow forever. Uh, Seaside Swirl, I think, was a really good new series. There's red, there's pink, and there's one called Blush we'll have as well. Um, but these will be lower rugoses, a little bit tidier for height. They'll spread, but I'm going to get excellent fragrance and a lot of rose hips. If you're into having rose hips for an added interest in the fall and the winter, these will produce those beautiful fruits on there as well. Now if we look at some trees, a couple of these I had as demos in the fall, but we will have these coming in, a couple of these like Copper Rocket comes in this week finally. So Copper Rocket's a variety of paper bark maple, if, you're, if you've ever heard of those trees. Um, there's nothing wrong with regular paper bark maple, and we've had, we have other varieties as well, but I thought Copper Rocket was a little different, so we tried a few this season where it's gonna be narrower. So if I'm looking for a paper bark that's got a really nice uniform, narrow shape for a small landscape, that's the way to go. Paper bark's got beautiful full color and you can see the bark close up there. I'm gonna get that coppery, peely bark on that year round, um, which is even better as it grows older. So uh, paper bark's a great little tree. Uh, Red bud is a, another tree kind of more from Canada and the Midwest, super hardy. These would bloom on bare wood, so we get the four leaves come out, little red bud flowers come out on the stems, typically they're pink or lavender in color. Uh, this has got great foliage. <clears throat> Golden Falls will have a weeping habit, and you'll have that beautiful lime green yellow foliage all through the season, and then they turn really nice fall color. So maybe a, a weeping type specimen tree for a small garden. This won't probably ever get taller than seven or eight feet tall and then cascade back down to the ground. So very prunable, uh, very manageable for, for a landscape. Uh, Cornelian cherry, um, ours is about to bloom. We've got a big old species one here on the property. That's in the dogwood family, but it blooms yellow really early, typically in mid-February, early March, it's in full bloom. Um, I put two pictures on there because that does get the, the Cornelian cherries or the little fruits on there afterwards, which some people like Again, an added interest for the birds. Um, they are edible, they don't taste very good, I don't think, but um, some of the, the, the UK uses that in many different dishes. You can kind of use it for, for some cooking purposes. Uh, but this again, the difference in this is growth habit. We have this in stock out there, they're just starting to bloom. But if you like the early blooming dogwood, the, the cornice moss, but I want something again, narrow and tidy, that's not gonna get so large, uh, saffron sentinel is the way to go. Uh, lots of new magnolias um, that have come out the last couple years. We had a little bit of these last year. This year we've got a nice stock of them. If I'm looking for yellow magnolia or tulip trees, some people call these, this will have a little bit of pink at the base, but that was a beautiful bright yellow flower. This one will have our first batch in this week um, on Monday, actually. Uh, we'll have these back in again for 2023. Um, again, a little bit narrower habit, a little, it'll still get tall. Um, but probably a little narrower, tidier habit for, for a modern yard. Uh, I almost didn't put nightfall on here because I think I have two plants um, and we'll have more in the fall. This is brand new for this year. Um, I love foliage myself and if I can have the same tree as another version but add some foliage interest, um, I'm in and that's what nightfall is. This is a purple leafed snowbell so I would have fragrant little white light pink flowers in May, June, they hang down on the on the wood there, but this is going to have that dark purple foliage all through the season. I think that's a really cool landscape specimen. Again, being weeping, not very tall, very prunable, that I can kind of turn into whatever character I'd like to. A couple Japanese maples, uh, Koto Maru is on the newer side. I added one of these to my garden somehow last year. I found a spot for it. Um, I got one in the fall. 
Uh, that's a small twiggy dwarf one, so mm -hmm. I can prune this how I want. Um, it'd be a great one for a container, but a lot of color. This one kind of comes out with some orange on it. I get another flush of orange in the summer, and then that's a picture in the fall. Uh, some nice fall color as well. Uh, mini maple, that's a picture of mine leafing out last year. Um, we've had these off and on the last few years, but they've been really hard to come by. And if you're a maple collector, you like tiny growing Japanese maple. This is the only maple we carry that is not grafted. This is growing from a seed. So every plant's a little different. They grow super slow and they're really fun to grow in pots. Mine's going on about 18 years old in a pot, which is only like this big in my landscape. I've had it out there for years. It didn't even have a name when I got mine. Now they decided to call it mini maple, which is a good name. But mine is literally, if I took it out of the pot, it would be about this tall and about that wide, and that's it. And I've never pruned it. So very tidy, very small, uh, even suitable for some bonsai. Uh, a couple is Pacific Rim Collection. Um, this one is worth looking up online if you like cool maples. These are the two latest introductions from Isley. We got samples of both of these in the fall. We ordered some more here for spring. Um, but both those are our new cross of maple so it's not maybe as important to us here but if we were on the other side of the mountains or in the midwest where we can have japanese maple Isley spent about 20 years breeding these japanese maples crossed with korean maple so it's going to look like any other japanese maple in the yard but we've, we've increased our hardiness about 20 degrees the, the good direction so a lot of these will go down like 20 below zero where typical maples are hardy right at around zero, which again, not as worried too much about us in particular, uh, but certainly options for, for others down the road. So lots of new shrubs. I really had to cut down the shrub and the perennial list and pick a few here. Um, and we do have all these coming in here pretty quick. So this is a terrible name, I apologize. Proven Winners chose Perfecto Mundo for their new azalea, <laughs> which I'm not, uh, anyway. Um, this will be available in all colors. We have white, purple, pink, and red on order. We'll have probably later March they'll come in. Um, I'm always looking for azaleas that bloom more than once a year. You know, I love my azaleas in spring. Awesome if you can bloom again for me and give me another season of interest. Most of the series out, like Encore, are not very hardy in our area. We get a cold winter, Exhibit A, the last couple days. Um, you're going to have damage to a lot of those Zone 8 azaleas. These go down to zone six, so I'm down there at zero and I'm not gonna worry about winter damage as much. So these would bloom double flowers, whatever color I want. Um, they're nice compact, about three feet tall. They'll take some sun, some shade, um, and I will get repeat flowering. Spring, there's about a six, eight week gap and then I'll have bloom late summer into fall, which I think adds a whole nother interest with the azaleas. A couple new abelias, if you like abelias. Uh, we tend to like them here. They're great for pollinators, and this is an excellent shrub choice if I'm looking for color late summer and not so much in spring or early summer like most things. So this will have great foliage all through the late spring, summer, and then flam. We get into flower in more like the late August, September, early October time frame. So Trace Amigos is all about the foliage. This is going to have a white fragrant little tube flower just like the other side there. But that's going to give me yellows, pinks, whites, greens, different color tones um, on the foliage itself. On the other side there, Raspberry Perfection is going to have a little flush of red and be super compact, like three feet tall and tidy. It won't need shearing. If you've grown abelias, sometimes we get big archy stems out of them and they're not maybe the, the tidiest plants in the world. Uh, both of these would be the new generation, kind of a little tidier with excellent fragrance and the late bloom on them. A butterfly bush, we love our pollinators at Sunnyside, so I'm always on the search for anything that attracts bees, hummingbirds, butterflies, anything. Um, we have to be careful with butterfly bush in Washington. Um, old fashioned butterfly bush is illegal. Uh, they go to seed everywhere, so we search out sterile varieties. It won't matter to the pollinator but it will matter to you because you won't have seedlings popping up all over your yard. Um, so this, these are both new series that we'll have in this year, the Chrysalis series um, and this Butterfly Candy series, a little bit shorter plants. There'll be different colors of both. We can choose our color tone, 
uh, from whites to pinks to blues to purples, kind of all those um, in each of those series, but both of them will be excellent choices if you like the, uh, the pollinators. Uh, one of these is fall, so autumn rocket camellia will be out in the fall of 23. I will not have any plants till like late August. Um, I put it on here because I think that's a total revolution in camellias. That's a winter bloomer, so that would bloom in like November, December time frame, which is awesome. But that growth habit's the difference. That's one that's going to keep a very upright, narrow shape. We won't have to prune it. It won't get super bushy. Um, we get a lot of cool camellias in, but this one I've never seen a columnar a camellia. So that's a brand new one. I think it's going to change, offer, offer gardeners a little different choice for, for fall, winter bloom, and for a different growth habit. Uh, I have banana split coming here pretty quick. That's a brand new winter Daphne. Um, you can see the picture there. I got a sample. I have one at my house. It doesn't care about the cold. It looks frozen. I went and looked at it this morning. The leaves are hanging down and it's cold, but it's still fine. Um, Daphne is extremely fragrant. This would bloom here starting about now into April. Um, these love that part sun, part shade. Banana Split's got superior variegation, so if you're into cool foliage, same typical Daphne flower, uh, but that's going to have the most yellow I think I've ever seen on a new Daphne. Monrovia uh, just found this last year. This is a great example. Growing a bunch of Daphne, you walk out one year like, wait a minute, that one is really yellow. What's going on with that? Over the last couple seasons, they were able to get it stable and introduce a brand new variety called Banana Split. Um, make sure with the Daphne we've got good drainage. The one kiss of death to all Daphne is too much wet or clay. So we just want to make sure we've got good drainage on those. A um, couple others. Paloma Blanco we've had around here for a couple years in limited quantities, but we'll have more this season. Um, that's a euonymus, so great sun tolerant, super drought tolerant. Um, I've used it in pots is my main thing. Um, I think it's an excellent little evergreen, small and tidy that we can add to container gardens or smaller landscapes. But if you like white, when that flushes mm -hmm. out the leaves, that's got really good contrast between super dark green, old growth, and brand new white. Uh, that's a nice little statement mm -hmm. plant, I think, again, especially to me for a container. Uh, there's lots of good forsythias out there. This one should be in bloom right now. Mine opened up a couple weeks ago in my house in Everett. It won't care how cold we get. Forsythia is super hardy. Uh, this is a new one uh, out of Bailey first edition shrubs. We'll have this in next week. They're finally delivering our spring load um, It's just another option for forsythia if you like early yellow color uh, Forsythia there's there's some really good ones out there, but I think spring fling was an extremely heavy bloomer Maybe a little wider and not quite as tall if you're looking for that growth habit But uh, certain certainly something that can be pruned for pretty much any landscape location. Unfortunately, as I smile, lots of hydrangeas, it seems like every year. There's way too many hydrangeas. We're going to have to start kicking some out of here if I keep buying new ones because I can't seem to say no to a cool hydrangea. Um, a lot of these will start trickling in a little later in spring. You're probably looking at May and June for optimum hydrangea selection. Uh, there are some really good new ones on here. There's quite a few. I'll go through them pretty fast, but uh, tiny, tough stuff. And Tough Stuff Aha, you can see Tiny Tough Stuff is like the original mountain hydrangea, so a little bit hardier than most mm -hmm. hydrangeas. Super good fall color. Uh, most hydrangeas just kind of turn melt, you know, melt yellow and lose their leaves. These ones you would see a real heavy dose of red burgundy fall color, which adds another interest to them. They're a little hardier, like I said, than most other hydrangeas. Tiny Tough Stuff's going to be small repeat blooming and tidy that's one that we won't take up much space for i think you keep that at three feet aha is going to give me double flower so that's not the same plan i tried to kind of fuse uh, two pictures together so you can see with these hydrangeas we can play with the ph and if we want blue that's what you're going to get in western washington we have acid soil so i'll have blue if i want pink i can add a little potassium nitrate or something to adjust my pH and I can pick my shade of pink as well. So keep, keep that in mind. LD is Let's Dance. It's another one I'm not sure what Let's Dance has to do with hydrangeas, but that's what Proven Winners calls one of their series. And these are a couple uh, good new ones again. 
Uh, let, let, let's Dance Can Do is going to be that big lace cap type flower. Again, repeat blooming, blooms on new and old wood, all the good traits of the new style hydrangeas, but a big old flower, and again, a nice compact growth habit. Uh, Sky View, again, pink or blue, you can see in the picture, that's going to be a big round mop head flower. So if I'm looking for a huge flower on single stem, that might be one to try for Sky View. Again, repeat blooming, new, new style generation hydrangea. Some other ones, um, this is a new one called Sublime. So that is in full bloom, that's not bud. This would bloom like a lime green color, which is kind of interesting in the landscape, to be honest. Uh, that's an arborescence hydrangea, so a little bit different. Those take all the sun you have. So that's not one we put in shade, that's one we plant out in full sun or part sun. And those are a little different, little different style. They call those smooth hydrangeas. So big round flowers, little different foliage, nice yellow fall color, but much more sun tolerant than our than our than mop head hydrangeas. On the right there <coughs> is PG hydrangeas. So those are paniculata or our big cone blossoms. Those again are good for sun. We don't have to tuck those in shade. They love the sun and they are easy to grow. Those are some of the easiest hydrangeas I think because they bloom on new wood so I can do whatever I want for pruning, for keeping them cut back in the spring to start the season. I'll keep my plant much shorter and have fabulous flowers. So quick fire fab. We had a little sample of those last year. We have a bunch for this season. Uh, that's one we'll see the multicolor flower on a super compact plant. That's probably the smallest uh, hydrangea for, for paniculatas these days. I think you'll keep that under three feet tall in the sun. The shrub of the year is pop star. So if I was at a geek show <coughs> and a bunch of plant nerds like me were voting, that's the plant of the year that we all voted for. That was best in show at three different conventions I was at. That's the latest introduction from Bailey Nursery's Endless Summer Collection. You guys have probably all tried Endless Summer Hydrangeas. So Popstar is the new one. <coughs> Excuse me. So lace cap flowers on a tiny plant. This is one I'm going to probably buy one because I'm out of room, but I'm going to put it in a pot because this is one we could grow in a container uh, for color or a small landscape spot. Preferably morning sun, afternoon shade, not too much afternoon sun on those. But that is the smallest one I've seen, and that's what they were bred for, was super easy growth, blooming on new and old wood for maximum flower, and small stature. That, that's a perfect example for Popstar. Pink Dynamo, <coughs> we have coming from another grower, and that one again, lace cap flower, if you can see in the picture there, the difference is I'm going to have burgundy foliage. So again, if I like the hydrangea, typical lace cap flower, but I want to add interest, that's going to give me that burgundy foliage color um, as, it, as it leaps out in spring and keep that color with green through the entire growing season. Lava lamp flare. We like our old hippie lamps. There's another, there's another PG type hydrangea. Uh, you can see again big huge cone flowers those are going to be massive and i'll see that progression of kind of dark pink light pink to white as they're blooming they all will eventually fade to like a dark rose color as we get towards fall but again all the pgs bloom on new wood really easy to grow that's one that will give you a little larger plant up there probably six or seven foot if you're looking for a nice specimen hydrangea but a big flower and a lot of them on those. Another green hydrangea. I wasn't sure if I like this one, but I think I might have to try one too. Uh, this is out of that Everlasting series. So these were bred for the floral culture. So massive flowers and big thick stems. This is not one that's going to flap on a wet day. You're going to be more upright, super low. This one does not bloom on new wood. I want to make sure that's clear. It's one of the few new hydrangeas that we get in every year that's more old school so it blooms on last year's wood so we can't prune it very hard but being dwarf and not big I, we've had other ones of these they don't get very big anyway i don't think you're going to miss any flower just by tidying it every year 
and allowing it to do its thing. The big thing with these, the difference is, the flowers last about five months. So I'm gonna open lime green, and as the months go by in summer and the fall, I'm gonna see a kaleidoscope of different colors come into the flowers. They're really cool, dried, very cool in arrangements. But the biggest thing is, again, instead of having a bloom that comes up, I enjoy for a month, it disappears, and another one replaces it. This one's there for the whole summer, fall, but changing color through the whole season, okay? Uh, love is one I'm gonna have double flowers on, which I think is really cool. If you look at that flower there, that'll be a round mop head type, but that's got beautiful double petals. That looks like a painting to me. It doesn't even look real. So that's going to be a fun one. We'll have those in a little bit later in spring. And then kimono is kind of another one that will stay red. I don't think you're going to see that one change color. They're telling me that one will not change with pH. But that would be, I'm going to have that red flower with a light center, big flowers. And again, the bonus of the burgundy foliage is the, is the kicker to me. I'm going to have really nice dark burgundy leaves with that hot red flower. <clears throat> now some foliage stuff. I don't know if anybody's battling boxwood blight. Um, I'm never going to get rid of my boxwood. I think more boxwood sometimes people think are boring, um, but I think they serve a purpose. It's easy green. They make great hedges. I use mine as kind of columns in my gates and things for form for a little bit of formality. Um, I think they're easy to grow and I won't get rid of my boxwood, but we've had a lot of customers the last couple years are concerned about boxwood blight that's traveling across the country in the groundwater there's no cure for it we have to pitch plants and start over again so if you're worried about it another option is japanese holly and these are a couple we get a lot of good japanese hollies in they look just like boxwood you can clip them you can do all the same things but we obviously don't have any issues with uh, boxwood blight with with other plants so these are a couple new ones that we tried in the fall. We got a bunch here coming spring. I have both these in stock already. Luxus Globe, dark green, perfect little round tight ball. It's gonna look just like a dwarf boxwood, um, but again, be a little sturdier maybe for you. Um, we can grow those in pots, grow them in the landscape, clip it into a hedge, you can do whatever you like, but very tidy and very globe shaped naturally without doing much maintenance on those at all. The Ruby Colonnade, would be kind of like our old sky pencil Japanese holly or a columnar boxwood. So I'm looking for something that's upright, not so wide, that'll give me for a container specimen or a narrow area in the yard where I want something evergreen. I thought these were pretty cool. You can't tell in the picture, but all my new leaves have that purple kind of ruby color too, which again, lots of green around Western Washington. It's nice to add a little bit of foliage interest on each season with that. Uh, nine barks are always one of my favorites. I've got a couple in my yard. Um, I'm probably going to try that yellow one if I can talk my wife into it and I find a spot for it because I'm out of room. Um, but I do like nine barks. These are indestructible, super, super hardy. The birds love them. They got really cool peely bark in the wintertime. Um, they do get a nice flower. You know, I enjoy the flower. It comes out May, June. It's like a little button flower, uh, but excellent fall color. And this is spring, you know, they have great foliage color through spring, summer, and fall color. So maybe you want a deciduous plant, it's got some nice bark interest with some sweet foliage color. These are two brand new ones we'll have next week, they're coming, uh, that will add that interest. Nine barks can be huge, you know, eight, nine, ten feet. I've got one on my front that's that big. These are not that big, these are dwarf ones. Lucky Devil will give me golden foliage, Spicy Devil coppery burgundy purple colors um, and both those would be more like six feet tall a little bit smaller leaf a little bit more manageable in size uh, i'm shocked to myself i put an english laurel on here because that's not one of my favorite plants um, but i did because it is kind of new we tried these out last year um, you know if you like laurel this is probably a little tidier than, than traditional english laurel Volcano doesn't mean anything except for the new growth is actually a coppery color, which is really pretty, doesn't last long, but again, it's not just green. It adds a little bit of spring interest on there. Um, that can be clipped into a hedge. It's not a 20-foot laurel, not, not, not regular species English laurel. It's going to be about 
half that size at most. So I could clip this into an easy 6-8 foot visual edge. <clears throat> Maybe a little better variety than, than old fashioned laurel. And I, again, a little bit of foliage color on there is a bonus. Um, I put some roadies on here. None of these are new. So these are new for Sunnyside. They're ones that I've been on a personal mission to make sure we had at some point. Finally this year we're going to have them. Uh, some different colored flowers. My staff might clean out of the dark one here before. Hopefully we'll have enough for everybody. Uh, but Black Widow is almost black. If you're into cool roadie foliage, that's, that's kind of the flower. That's kind of a little different rhododendron. That's a, like a deep, deep burgundy black color. About as dark as I've ever seen. Uh, Coastal Spice is one I've been trying to get off. Uh, there's a grower down the Oregon coast that grows those. That's got excellent fragrance for a roadie. There's only like 15 of them coming. If you want one, leave your name because I don't think they'll last long. Uh, but that's one that you would get great fragrance on. That's got some sweet foliage too. That's probably not for everybody. If I'm down here in town, I'm okay. If I head up into the hills, I'm probably not going to grow Coastal Spice. That one's down there to about 10 degrees above zero. So not the hardiest roadie in the world, but for typical city areas, you'll be fine for the winter time. Uh, I will be grabbing one of these super flimmers. I've been down and begged for these for about 25 years. I think I have salivated for one. Uh, we have 20 of them coming this year, and I called again last week to make sure before I put this on the show. If you like cool foliage, you're not going to beat super flimmer. That is the most variegated rhododendron I've ever seen. It's got a pretty cool flower on it too. I could care less if that blooms. I think that's got some sweet leaves on it. Um, that one is coming. Part sun, part shade is probably best. Um, but that's one to get in here or leave your name or get in here early because there's only going to be 20 plants. Um, but the superior variegation over anything I've ever seen in the, the rhododendron world. <clears throat> the other dark one is Dark Lord. So that's finally coming this year too. We'll have a few of those. Maybe not quite as dark as Black Widow, but still that picture doesn't do it justice. It, it looks kind of purpley in there. It's definitely a black burgundy purple color again. Maybe just a little lighter than the, than the first one, but uh, still dark. Um, I picked up one of these last year in the fall that laced up elderberries. Anybody growing a few elderberries around? They're great shrubs. If you get two different varieties, you'll get berries on them for the birds too. They're easy to produce fruits as well. Um, these are, I think, a great combination of foliage color and really nice flower in spring. Um, I think this really filled a gap for me. Uh, I always liked black lace elderberry, but I grow for a few years and say, that's enough. You're just too big for my yard. There's a lot of them around. I see 15 feet tall um, if you don't prune them. This will give me height, but way less spread. This is one I'm feeling pretty comfortable. I'll keep about 8 feet tall, 3 feet wide without having to do a whole bunch of pruning on it. So uh, this was, I think, filled a gap for, to me for elderberry because we want the, the cool foliage on it, the nice flower. If you like to pollinate, get a second variety. Really cool fruits on it for the birds, but I'm not gonna eat up my yard. Uh, Cubafolia, that's an old school lilac. I probably haven't had that in 20 years. Um, I had one at our family place in Cleelum. I haven't seen it, like I said, probably 20, 25 years, and we finally found a source for these. If you can tell in the picture, <clears throat> it's like any other lilac. It looks like President Grevy's, an old blue one. It's got kind of a bluish lavender flower, super fragrant, grows just like all the French lilacs, but the foliage is unbelievable. That's the only stable variegated lilac I've ever seen. So if you'd like it to be streaked with yellow, they call that a Cuba folia because it kind of looks like a kuba plant which is a shade plant uh, with lots of yellow on the foliage that's got some sweet color to it um, if you like a little different lilac uh, butterscotch baby spirea i like butterscotch so i was probably partial to that one uh, this is a brand new spirea we had just got these in our first batch of them they haven't leafed out yet these are deciduous um, but this is for that color Kind of that butterscotchy, orangey, apricot foliage, nice pink flower, way better disease resistance for mildew, and super compact. These are really easy to grow. We can shear these into little twig mounds in late winter. They only get nice and low and bushy every year. Um, and they'll take some wet, which is nice with spirea. They'll take a little bit more wet too. Um, but if you're looking for a new spirea, I thought that was the, 
the top of the totem poles they say for for new spireas for 2023 and then we got a couple white gelias i always kind of smile most people ask for wiglia we kind of know by both names um <clears throat> you know white gelia i think back to my grandmother and i remember the white gelia that was about 10 feet tall and 18 feet across and like buried her shed because that's what i white gelia was for my whole childhood Nowadays, there is fabulous, great dwarf Wygelia. We get a bunch of these in. Um, a lot of them bloom twice a year now, which is even nice. Um, but these were two uh, new ones. Very fine wines out of Proven Winters. Super dark purple foliage, hot pink flower. Great for the pollinators and hummingbirds. That'll be blooming like that May-June time frame. And I thought the red on Electric Love is spectacular. That's not a color combination I've seen with the dark purple foliage again and the lipstick red flower. That one again, I think is very low, tidy, easy to grow uh, for a nice sunny garden. So perennials, um, lots of different new perennials. I probably only put a fraction of them on here. I tried to put a few I think were really worthwhile. Um, Agastache, or some people call that hyssop, hummingbird mint. That's a fabulous plant for hummingbirds, for pollinators. They bloom a long season, so these are going to start when we warm up in June and go all the way through the fall. I've got a couple different hyssops in my little butterfly garden off the patio, um, but that's going to offer me fragrant foliage in a long bloom time on a compact plant again. These don't have to get so tall like they used to, so much, much shorter. Um, I've already cleared the spot for three dark side of the moon is still bees for my yard so there'll be some more here we got about 30 or 40 coming um, I think that's the plant of the year to me I love a still bee anyway um, it's really hard to get foliage color in shade gardens this will give me that black purple foliage and a purple flower is the difference I've got an old one called chocolate shogun there's nothing wrong with it because I like the plant He's going to the compost heap in the sky, and Dark Side of the Moon is going in his place this year in my yard. Um, Chocolate Shogun's got a great same foliage, but just kind of a washed out flower. I could care less if it even bloomed. It's just like, just give me the leaves. This one, I'm psyched for the flower and the foliage as well. Plus, we like Pink Floyd around here, so I'm going Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, clematis. <clears throat> lots of cool clematis. Um, for us, I try to stick with um, what they call the Vancouver series. <clears throat> so this is UBC up in British Columbia, not too far north of us, our Canadian neighbors, A. Eh? We got that, plus Clearview, which is honestly the world's largest breeder of Clematis, period. That's in British Columbia as well. Those two got together and decided to make a Vancouver series, which is a good idea on their part. So they continue to introduce new varieties in these. Um, we get quite a few of them in. I think all the ones that are available we'll have against this year. These were the two new ones for 2023 for us. Um, those pictures, it's hard to find pictures of these because they're so new. They're really washed out. That daybreak is a lot more purple than that with the white bars and the purple stamens. That's a big flower. The Deborah Daw is a lavender color with a massive red stamen in the middle. The contrast was beautiful the plants I saw last fall so those are both easy to grow clematis ever blooming the two bloom cycles and not super large that's what I like about their clematis I get reliable bloom May June a quick little regrow and then bloom again in August September and these might reach like six feet so much more manageable for a trellis a post I don't have to have a jungle of clematis growing across my arbor to get flower I can keep these much, much tidier. Uh, Coptonia, I decided to finally break down and bring it in. Has anyone ever tried these sweet, they call them sweet fern shrubs? Do you like yours? Love it. Yeah, and it's a great plant. Um, I've been hesitant because I don't want people to think A, it's a fern, and B, it's not native here. It's native in a lot of other areas of the country, but not the Northwest. But this will give you the native look. If you've got deep shade, dark shade, wet shade, dry shade, I think it pretty much grows anywhere. It doesn't care about soil, it doesn't care about much. It's a really easy plant. Um, I think it's got great texture, which is probably why you grabbed it maybe. And it's fragrant. And, and fragrant too. I mean, it's a cool plant that'll colonize, so it doesn't transplant very easily. I can't buy one, dig it up, move it later. It's a tough one to transplant, 
but if I've got an area I want to naturalize, this would be a really fun kind of old-fashioned trail. This isn't new, but kind of new at Sunnyside. Um, we'll have a bunch of these in a little later in spring. Uh, Crocosmia, um, we get lots of different cool Crocosmia, and Sun Lover's a new one. Um, I tend to gravitate towards the small ones for me. I don't need old Lucifer, the evil Lucifer that's growing six foot and hanging over my driveway. I like the two or three foot ones that I can probably maintain a little better. This I'll be picking up some for sure. I don't have this color in my Crocosmia palette quite yet. It's a little more yellow than it is orange. Um, I've got some great dwarf, red dwarf, orange ones to me This filled that yellow gap. So we've got a little shorter, like two foot tall Crocosmia for the hummingbirds. That's a great, great little bulb to grow. Uh, Delosperma, we would call hardy ice plant. So if I'm going Xeriscape, I got sun, I got slope, I got rockery, I got no water, and I really don't want to water much. Uh, hardy ice plant's a great choice for a ground cover. That's a flat little succulent with sweet flowers. Um, early birds, the new series, there'll be some color color options too that just blooms earlier now. I don't have to wait till July. Now I'm going to start blooming in June for the summertime. So a little earlier color doesn't need quite as much heat. The other thing with these, if you've noticed with ice plant, a lot of them close, right? When the sun's not out, they don't open. When the sun is out, they open. These new ones will be open one way or another, which I think is a nice bonus too for, for hardy ice plant. We don't have to go to Utah and wait for the heat every single day for it to open. They'll open every day in the garden now. Uh, Dianthus, Old Fashioned Carnations. <clears throat> the American Pie series uh, is one that we carry. We get a bunch of cool <clears throat> Dianthus in. These again, drought tolerant, easy to grow, low, great little perennial for rockeries or slopes or borders. Uh, this is one called Berry a la Mode, if you like berry pie like me, and that's one, I, that's one I might have to try. But there's a lot of options in this pie series that Berry a la Mode would be the latest one. And fragrant too, I always forget that with di Diantha, so it's got great fragrance. Uh, some new cone flowers, always lots of new cone flowers. I probably could have put 10 of them in here, I just picked one so we didn't have to be here for two hours. I'll be honest, I've always thought double cone flowers were kind of an abomination. I was like, that just doesn't belong. They don't grow like that. The bees don't like it, whatever. I, I think this one for a double, it's not so funky looking. I might have to try one of these because I think that looks like a pretty cool uh, double cone flower. So big center in it, nice color, great ruby red, um, drought tolerant, pollinator friendly, all the cool things with cone flowers that we expect. Just make sure we got good drainage and a good sunny location. That would be a, an excellent cone flower to give a try to. Uh, Epimediums, if you haven't tried those, we actually have Pretty and Pink in already. We got some more coming as well. Um, Epimediums, those old bishop's caps, they grow in dry shade. They're really easy. I have these all over my backyard because I don't want to water and I have zero maintenance on them. They're really easy to grow. So this will form like a little ground covery kind of patch, maybe a foot tall at most. And then these blooms come out right now. Mine are just starting to bloom in my yard too. The flowers come out early spring and I've got really nice foliage all through the seasons. These don't go dormant like typical perennials. So I think this is one, if you've got a tough dry shade location, look at epimediums and in particular, I think that new one's got a great flower, that pretty and pink. I'll be grabbing some of these black and white geraniums. I've always liked the black and the, the dark foliage with the light flower on geranium. The rabbits ate my three again last year, so I'll buy three more this year. <laughs> See if I can keep the rabbits out. Um, that will happen a little bit later, but this is again a new geranium uh, from our perennial grower with deep purple black foliage and a pure white little Cranesville geranium flower. So super hardy perennial. I would have this in sun, not shade. The more sun, the darker the foliage I'm gonna get out of it. Um, but if you can keep the rabbits from nibbling them in spring, like my yard, um, you'll have this forever. This is an easy easy perennial type geranium to grow. Um, I've always been a huge fan of forest grass. I'm still finding a place for this new one. I gotta try this new one, because I saw a bunch of these last year at a show, and this was the top rated perennial introduction for 2023 by the Plant Geeks. Um, if you know forest grass, they do shade, part shade, they form nice clumps, great fall color. They are perennial, so they'll die in the winter and come back in spring. 
this picture might not do it justice but it's a totally different color than any of the ones I've seen this is combines white with yellow and green in the same blade we always had to choose yellow and forest grass or white and forest grass this is one that's got kind of all three in one um, I thought it had pretty cool color depending on what you kind of pop it with in the landscape that would really brighten up a nice shade or part shade area um, in the garden with the grass a couple of fun ones Hidekium, those are hardy ginger so this will make you feel like you're hanging out in Bali or Hawaii in your yard for a little bit um, but we can grow hardy ginger up here just fine this grows from a tuber or a bulb we have not this one but we have these right out in front of the nursery here we've had them here for years and they always come back and they always grow great so this would bloom late summer not till late summer early fall uh, they have great smell nice fragrant flower but big bold tropical foliage and a big old tropical flower this will definitely give you a little taste of the 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 the, the equator if you want to get a little little tropical flavor in the landscape uh, heliopsis is false sunflower so my little guy max my eight-year-old loves sunflowers so we started planting some perennial sunflowers a few years ago so we can watch them come back and not plant seeds every year we do some of those too but this will be like our prairie sunflower we would always have it be hardy <clears throat> um, this is a bit of honey um, is beautiful variegation we've had a few variegated heliopsis over the years uh, I tried one of these last year this is the most stable one I've seen and it doesn't flop I think a lot of the variegated ones kind of flop open a little bit late summer um, but if I wanted a nice compact mounding type sunflower that's gonna bloom again midsummer all the way through fall that's got some sweet foliage uh, I'm the head of the Hookera Attic Club around here. I have Hookera Itis. Um, I'll probably have to buy both of these, although I have no, I'll probably put them in a pot again so I'm out of room. Um, I'm always looking for cool Hookeras. We get a lot of fun Hookeras in here. Um, I, I could probably put 50 of them on here every year and that still wouldn't be a fraction of what you can find. But to me, you know, why do we bring it in for you guys to shop? You know, what's different about it? The growth habit, not less disease brighter flower compact habit you know those are kind of the things i'm looking for to make them easier to grow um, i think timeless night for a dark purplish foliage ones the smallest one i've seen um, very nice scalloped leaves great for a pot or the garden on a border um, that's going to have a nice bloom spring summer fall as well a uh, timeless glow i'm going to definitely get for my shade garden that's the pinkiest flower I think I've ever seen on a hookah. That's not Photoshop. Um, and that's got some bright, limey chartreuse foliage. I've got other ones in my garden already like that, but I don't have that flower color. So that was one that caught my eye that we'll have in as well here for 2023. Now, has anybody been playing with the dinner plate hibiscus? So these need heat. I'm not going to lie to you. This is one that's going to leaf out late up here. They love fertilizer. Keep them fed if you want to get them big. And we're talking like August. You know, this is like a late July, August, early September thing in our climate for bloom. So they're, they're plenty hardy. This isn't a tropical thing by any means. These go down to below zero for hardiness. I just got to find the right spot to grow it in. And this will be a really nice summer perennial. Um, I put an example of what <clears throat> one plant looks like. Cherry Cheesecake's a great name for that one. And you can see that chart if you look on proven winners or you look online after class and you go to summerific hibiscus you'll see a zillion options for color you can pick whatever you want we get probably i bet you there's 15 different colors of these coming in here it won't be till later these will be like a may thing um, but we'll have a bunch of these to choose from when they come in uh, some great new hostas. I have hosta addiction too, so I'm probably going to have to find a spot for a couple of these. Uh, Wu La La has got a great name. If you remember, Empress Wu came out a few years ago from Proven Winners. Slated as the biggest hosta in existence. The leaves are monstrous. I think it grows five feet tall when you get an old plant. Uh, Wu La La would be the sister plant to Empress Wu if I like some variegation. So, that we'll call Empress Wu with color. Empress Wu is kind of just blue, uh, blue-green color. This one's going to give me the blue-green with a beautiful yellow margin on it. So 
I, I, I'm not saying this lightly. If you're looking for a specimen hosta, like not this little, oh, look at my cool hostas, but like, wow, that looks like a shrub in summer. <laughs> Try a woo la la. That's a big old plant and that's a huge leaf. Uh, Dancing Queen um, is the hosta of the year for 2023. If we like some ABBA, she's starting to sing here. We're doing the ABBA disco, right? <clears throat> um, this has got all yellow leaves, and I have not been a fan of all yellow leaf tosses because I think they burn or get tattered, but this is the new one I think is going to be a lot more sturdy up here. We tried this last year, and talking to some people who have tried this one, I think it's going to hold up better in our landscape. So if you want a real bright pop of yellow, um, maybe try Dancing Queen. I don't know that I'd put that in deep dark shade. If we've got that in morning sun, afternoon shade would be perfect because then I'll get the yellow with the sun on it, but I'll have that afternoon protection so it probably won't burn when we do get hot in August. Hopefully we get hot sometime, right? Uh, Dream Queen is gonna give me the big old puckered leaves, another large grower. Uh, being puckered like that, maybe a little more resistant to slugs if you've got the slug infestation like most of us do in this area. Uh, they tend to stay away from the puckered or stifled foliage ones like that. Um, and I love yellow, um, and I've tried a lot of yellow hostas. My favorite still to this day is one called Liberty, um, and I think Autumn Frost looks an awful lot like Liberty. I'm kind of curious to see how it grows here, because uh, I think it might be a close relative of Liberty, which is one we always get as well. Uh, Shasta Daisies, new ones again. More compact, heavier blooming, great for pollinators. If you like old fashioned Shasta Daisy, uh, the Gemini is part of this new series. There'll be a few of them out. I think that's as good as any one I've seen for Shasta Daisy for growth habit. And if you like red hot pokers, you know, the hot colors in the yard, but you don't want giant red rocket junior says it all. I want a little tiny red hot poker with that grassy foliage and that hot little flower spike for the pollinators in the summer. That would be a great addition to a sunny little uh, pollinator garden. There's always new lavenders out. <clears throat> this Ventro Blue, um, I made note of myself because it really was bred for us. This is a Northwest Lavender that they're saying is way better with wet winters. Doesn't, doesn't defoliate like sometimes. Won't get all woody like some things we've tried. Um, we got a bunch of these coming in. And I think this might take the place for English lavenders as kind of the go-to um, lavender for the Northwest. I think this one was, again, kind of bred for the Western Washington, Western Oregon, a little bit wetter spring weather. Uh, this Monardella is really cool. I'm going to be taking some of these home when they come in. They'll be here a little later. Um, that is the only plant I think I've ever in my life had in a show from Southern California. So we would not find this growing anywhere except down in Southern California. The funny part is, it's hardy to zone four. So this is plenty hardy to grow up here. The kicker is gonna be the wet. This is not one I'm gonna plant on my little soggy border that gets filled with water in the winter. This is for your rockery, slope, a dry container, put it with sedums. I think there's some really good uses for this plant, but that is this really cool miniature. I mean, this is a little guy that's gonna grow low and mound. I could have it spill out of a container, tuck it in a rockery. Uh, this would be an absolute hummingbird magnet when this blooms over the summer. So super drought tolerant, plenty hardy enough, but we gotta go down into the mountains and the hills outside of Los Angeles to find a growing native. Uh, another big old bold tropical, the Musa. So that's hardy banana. If you've tried hardy bananas before, big huge banana trees, they do get bananas on them, not like the ones you'll get in the grocery store. They do get a really cool flower with age, but if you're going bold and you want to make a statement, there's your tropical tree right there. If you can wrap the trunk and not let that trunk freeze out in the winter, I've seen Mekong Giant down around Portland at about 20 feet tall. So, I mean, this would be a big old, like, what the heck is that in his yard? I mean, a monster tropical banana tree. They're plenty hardy for up here. And even if you kill it to the ground, it's going to come back up off the root system. So you kind of start over again. But if you wrap the trunk and protect it a bit in the winter, you can have an actual banana tree. Uh, switchgrass, 
Um, again, drought tolerant, prairie grass, big old seed for the birds in the fall, nice fall color. These turn rusty oranges and purples and reds in the fall. If I want a good drought tolerant grass, a clumping type, <coughs> maybe three or four feet tall at the most when it's in plume in the fall, um, take a look at switch grasses. I think prairie dog is a one that will color a little earlier and have a superior seed count too. That was a really nice variety for 2023. Mondo grass is a short little evergreen grass. So everyone's probably seen black Mondo grass around. This is not a new, new plant, but we're starting to get more and more of them in. That would be a variegated type Mondo grass. So if I want to brighten up a little shady garden or morning sun, this makes a nice little ground cover or walkway edge uh, for a shadier garden with a little bit more color, and those are evergreen. Uh, Ito peonies, uh, that's the new one for us this year, Pink Ardor. Uh, we always look for new Ito peonies. If you haven't tried Ito peonies, this is the intersectional peony. So it's not cottage peony, it's not tree peony, it's both of those put together. So I'm going to have a massive, often fragrant flower like a tree peony, but I'm going to have a bushier growth habit that doesn't flop or need cages like herbaceous peonies, if that makes sense. I have a couple different ones of these in my yard. I love Ito's. They're not the cheapest plant in the world, I'll warn you. You're at about a hundred bucks, I think, for a big plant to start with. You can't find these a lot of times as starts. They take a long time to bloom. But if you're going to make an investment, you like peonies, Look at the Itos in particular, that Pink Ardor is new. Uh, some fabulous flowers and some really nice plants. Uh, Gardenia's old school peony that I relocated. We used to have these years ago. Uh, that is probably at the top of the fragrance list. That's a herbaceous peony. If you like white, that is an absolute perfume. I mean, those are going to smell your whole yard up when those are blooming. I've got a pink one like that. I'm going to see if I can find a, a room for a white one. <clears throat> at my place, but typical cottage peony, I would cage that to support it, but I've got cut flowers I can bring inside and enjoy the fragrance indoors um, or in the landscape either way. Lots of new flocks out. This flame series, this is flame watermelon. There's a few colors in that series. These will be a little later in spring. Um, the breeders continue for us in our area to do us a favor and try to breed out powdery mildew. I would never seen immune but again, far superior mildew resistance just keeps coming out with new garden flocks. So this will give me fragrant flower most of the summer, but a little bit cleaner foliage, hopefully without having to spray. The same with the opening act series, that's out of proven winners. I can get blues, I can get pinks, I can get whites, I can get purples, all the typical colors I want. But again, more compact, heavier blooming, and a little better with mildew resistance. On the right there is the other kind of flock. So Rocky Road is the new series. Again, violet, pink, white, red, different colors. These are our moss flocks, the short little mounding ones. We'll have these in next week actually. So these bloom in spring. I would get fragrance on those and I can use that again in a sunny rockery, a small spot where I want something tight and moundy, not upright like other perennials. Flock of flamingos made me smile. I'm not a pink guy, but if you like pink, I don't think you're going to get much more pink than flock of flamingos on the pinstamen. So that would be a Rocky Mountain wildflower, a little bit taller, about two feet tall. But again, for the bees, the pollinators, a great addition to the pollinator garden for sun. Um, I'm definitely picking up some of that new Jacob's ladder. That's golden feathers. Jacob's ladder, I think, is a sweet plant. For foliage, it does get a nice flower on it as well, but I've never seen a gold one like that. That has got really cool foliage on it. That would be a little clumping type perennial that I would get my purplish flower stalks out of later in spring, early summer. But I think again for a morning sun uh, to a full sun location, if I watered it in full sun, that's got some really sweet foliage. That would add a little pop or again a great container plant. <laughs> Uh, little Gecko is the new sedum that caught my eye. I thought that had some sweet leaves. I see a lot of yellow on sedums, but I don't know that I've seen something quite that bright gold. So that's a little tiny ground cover sedum. That's going to stay really short 
and spread into a little patch. It's not a crazy invasive type sedum, but for one again, for hot, dry, minimal water, it might be a great choice uh, for you. And then we got the Ninja Star, that's a toad lily. I took a picture of the flower. You can see the variegated foliage underneath there too. It's got some cool leaves. But that's a toad lily for shade. So if we're going morning sun to morning sun at most to more shade, that's a little clumpy kind of woodland perennial. Toad lilies aren't the easiest things to find. This we had a little bit last fall. Everybody loved the flower, so we got a bunch of these to come in a little later. These don't bloom till like August, September into October. So this would be one to come look for like midsummer. We'll have a bunch of these in for summer planning to enjoy that fall. A few conifers. We'll go faster and get you out. Um, AB's Blauer Blauer Hexe has got the blue coloration on it. Little miniature uh, Korean type fur with bright blue. If you got hot, dry, don't water much, that might be a fun little conifer for you. Uh, I've got these incense glow incense cedars coming in from Australia here in a few weeks. Um, these were like incense cedar, if you know, is real cedar, not our Western red. This will be what they make your drawers out of and in, in furniture. Super fragrant wood. Uh, these yellow ones were unbelievable, almost orangey color in the winter, and then more green to yellow during the growing season, um, and a lot smaller. Incense cedar is a pretty big creature down the road. These would be about half the size of a species, so I think you could easily keep this in your yard long term, maybe in the 10 to 12 foot tall range and about six feet wide, so a much more manageable size uh, for the garden. Uh, sparkling arrow. Now I'm pretty psyched about those. We got a bunch coming in. I think it's just a week or two at the most we'll finally have these. If you like weeping Alaskan cedar but you want to add color to it, get a sparkling arrow. That's got yellow variegated flecks all through the green on that same little narrow stately weeping easy to grow Alaskan cedar like we always have. So look for sparkling arrow. We had a little bit of these about two years ago. I finally put it on the list because this year we scored. I got a whole bunch coming in um, and we'll have a bunch, bunch of these around for our customers here pretty quick. A night light is a new Hinoki Cypress, the most sun tolerant yellow Hinoki. So if you like yellow, you like sun, you like the dry, the ease of drought tolerant Hinoki, that may be one to try. It's not necessarily a tree, but a large shrub, one I can clip even into a hedge some different areas in the yard. I think would have a few different purposes for that one. <laughs> Little miniature Japanese cedars. We have these in too already. This is Dragon Warrior. So small, little tight green cedar. You can see kind of dark black green in the winter. In the spring, we go kind of a limey green color to it. Really nice color change. 